Bitty say there's gain. And in this case, Jeff's oh-so-smooth skin. Every year, thousands upon thousands of people put themselves through torture in order to improve their self-image. How much pain? And how does that pain get where it's going? Ow. Ask a new expert. I was not ready for that. It was actually not that bad, <laughs> but you can feel it for sure. And now yeah. I'm like a baby again. Nice and smooth. All right, let's see what pain Cam had to show. It's totally gone. And you're still very happy. <laughs> Whoa! Oh. For quite some time, actually. And do people usually jump up and scream oh. like that? Does that happen a lot? <laughs> All the time, yeah. <laughs> well, how many frames a second are you getting this at? This is 500. Let's, let's just count it up. Okay, go. Maybe 50 frames. Which brings us to one of the points of this experiment. How long does it take the nerves to deliver the message that something is hurting big time? In this case, roughly 100 milliseconds between ripped out roots and Jeff's primal scream. That's what we'd expect. I mean, different types of pain receptors take different amounts of time, and the further away you get from the head, the more time you expect it to take. The proverbial plucked chickens got nothing on Jeff here. So this is 10 times slower. 5,000 frames per second. And then the really surprising thing for me is the, the waves. You are a good patient. Thanks. I appreciate that. We'll, we'll have you back for Matt next week. <laughs> oh, boy. Matt, not surprisingly, has another idea. Something just a little more manly. Tattoo artist Darlene DeBona will help him to shoulder his elective burden. The mysterious acronym is for Mackenzie, Sammy, and Casey, Matt's children. Of course, we tried to sell him on the shorter and less painful TW for time warp, but the kids won out. Maybe next season. Uh, there you go. I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's, it's going to be great. Let's get you inked. That didn't hurt at all. <laughs> yeah, I will in a second. So this is an electromagnetic oscillator? Yes. That's Jeff speak for okay. tattoo gun. And that's, wow, uh, seven needles in there? There is seven needles in here, but it's set up somewhat like, more like a, a paintbrush. More like a paintbrush. Does Jeff seem to be enjoying this just a tad too much? Okay, I'm tattooing now, right? Yep, you are. You ready? Yep. Here we go. You are getting it. Now, let's take a walk on the warp side. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> That's inside Maybe now. I do that every day. You do that half a million times to a million times every day. It's a good thing I can't see it that slow all no, the time. No, it's a lot more disturbing. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't show this in the lobby. <laughs> <laughs> Those seven steel needles are puncturing Matt at 70 times per second. But how long does it take Matt to register the initial pain? By the time he reacts, you've stabbed him, you know, 20 <laughs> times, right? Look at your face. I would say that's about 80 milliseconds delay. Pain is a, is a side effect <laughs> of the product. The pain is what we deal with so we can have our tattoo. Is it worth it? I dealt with it, yeah. It's totally worth it. It's great. <laughs> you dealt with it. You like, <laughs> I did. I, I, I dealt with it. No problem. Man, you did. Went, what, was, you did deal with were it. We you filming? were filming? Okay, pain from leg to brain, 100 milliseconds. From shoulder to brain, 80 milliseconds. So what happens when the pain is transmitted from a site right beside the brain? Jeff's up again, this time to lend an ear to science with piercer Aaron Duff. <laughs> this is gonna look cool. What I want you to do is just relax your body, and you're gonna give me a big, deep breath. Mm -hmm. At the end of the exhale, you'll feel a little pinch. Okay. You ready? My ear's pretty close to my brain, so this should be a very small delay. Okay. All the way out. <sighs> there it was. <laughs> and you're gonna make the transfer? Making the transfer. All right. Well, that's impressive. Like, Jeff's gotten some kind of zen counseling between the wax job... <laughs> 
than the ear thing. So what gives? And now I'm that much cooler. You are so cool. Uh, what is that? It's 40 milliseconds. It's a pretty smile. good delay. Yeah, and then, well, I knew I, knew I was cooler. You were very, very brave. <laughs> yeah, where's the lollipop? This is where we usually recap our highlights. But you know what? We think Jeff and Matt have endured enough pain. Wushu. Not a household name. Unless you live in the right house. This Chinese martial art translates motion into action in some astonishing ways. Award-winning Wushu master Rick Wong agreed to demonstrate its core defensive principles for our time warp cameras. Defensive principles that are vital to almost any martial art. Okay, class, watch closely. Here, the traditional weapons of broadsword and spear illustrate how force can be redirected. So it seems like for every action that he makes, you've got a, a reaction in the exact opposite direction with your weapon from his. So they have to match up in order for him to successfully execute his defense. If his technique is too static or doesn't accelerate at the same velocity, that sword will push through his block. It's like a defensive form of Newton's laws. That's right, right, exactly. Okay, we see the principle of blocking energy with weapons, but what about hand-to-hand -hand combat? Well, what we'll show is how you just borrow your opponent's intention and momentum to use the uh, maximum force. You, basically, the, the concept of borrowing their aggressiveness. So can you first show us a beginner's reaction? Okay, the typical beginner will just block something and do nothing with the incoming energy, such as... Okay, so using all of that momentum and stopping it cold. Right. Exactly. So at this point, what I want to do is, as that punch comes, I'm going to let it travel towards me. I'm going to pivot out of the way and let that turn make him lose his balance, such okay. as. All right, Matt, did you get all that? Uh, miss anything? Like <laughs> everything? <laughs> Let's warp that down. So we're looking right now at the original block of the punch. Notice the shock waves running through both of their arms. The force of the attack has been absorbed, dissipated, but ultimately wasted. Now let's apply some wushu to the same situation. Its central principle dictates a fighter use their opponent's energy to their own advantage. In this particular instance, when we look at uh, absorbing power, I let the arm come in. I don't really block it, but I'm turning and rotating with it. If I stay static, he's going to hit me at full velocity. As I move with it, I stay a small distance ahead of it, and he actually begins to decelerate because he understands that he's over-rotating. And that's where this technique works. Watch these moves again, side by side. On the left, force supplied by the attacker manifests in dissipating shock waves. The opposition, while blocked, still stands. On the right, there are no shock waves. Supplied force is smoothly redirected and the opponent goes down. Now, no exotic martial art would be complete without some kicks. Now we're going to borrow his energy and just use his sidekick power and have him go in the direction of the kick. Sidekick power? We thought that was Matt's gig. I'm basically pulling his leg further out just to take him forward of his base of support. Then when I twist and rotate, he's forced to uh, go straight down. Collapse. Do a face plant. Face plant? That's a nice euphemism for this humiliating action. 
gracefully fall. Yeah, gracefully fall on his face. Gracefully fall. Okay, sounds better. So class, almost dismissed. If his technique is too static or doesn't accelerate at the same velocity, that sword will push through his block. We've learned that our old friend and mascot, Isaac Newton's principles, apply in any situation. It's like a defensive form of Newton's laws. That's right. Now, there are team sports, and there are team sports. The one we just saw is a ballet of aggression. Some things never get old. Watching a tap dancer shuffle ball change through their paces will ever, it seems, inspire interest and fascination. Dancers Chloe Arnold, Bakari Wilder, and street percussionist Jermaine Carter happily obliged Time Warp's request to capture their infectious art form in high speed. Right. You're making me tired. I think we got a bunch of stuff to capture. So it's lights, camera, Time Warp. is on your shoes, because my shoes don't do that. It's, it's metal. Now you're probably aware that tap dancers wear metal taps. But did you know they can produce a range of frequencies? These sounds can be high, low, and in between. Toes and heels sound differently. Is uh, more of a treble, <laughs> more of a bass. Now right. What causes that? Lots of training and um, really knowing how to use your weight. I mean, a toe can be here, it can be here. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's just the front. Right. That's now, just the toe. As yeah. far as the heel is concerned, it could be more of like a weight thing. Real deep. And then, and then the soft. Yeah, yeah, so. You know what I mean? I was seeing you guys' calves go nuts, you know, shaking all over the place. So okay. I would love to get some close-ups of how those impacts are affecting yeah. it. We're good. One, two. Hopefully it's no, fine. I think it's fine. Now here's the same ditty shot at 300 frames per second. All right. Oh, that's crazy. Oh, my God. Oh. Oh my God. God. Even, I mean, there's a lot of impacts. Obviously, downward is the huge ones. Those are sending amazing shockwaves up your calves, both sides. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is about time, 10 times as slow as normal, so the fact that you're still in sync means you're really 10 right. times as accurate as you think. At time warp speed, their stunning precision is clearly dead on. So we've seen it fast. We've seen it slow. Now, Yet another dimension of Chloe's fast moving feet. Hit it. Suspended in midair. Oh, yeah. You ready? Here you can really see the impact on the table. And it's surprising to me, you don't even need to lift your foot that high off to get that impact. You, you're one inch off the ground and it's tons. That takes a long time to develop. And from below. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> it's just a, really, it's just a hot shuffle. Overall, the steps that we're doing are the same. It's just how we manipulate them, rhythmically. 
So Chloe gave it to us fast. She gave it to us slow, spun round, and upside down. Now we ask Chloe for our grand finale, is there any other way to see it? And there is. Wet and wild. this wouldn't be time warp if we didn't take you from the sublime yes. to the ridiculous. <laughs> and we're not done yet. Ever wonder what happens after hours in the time warp lab? Later. Good time. See ya. All those cameras sitting around, leftover explosives, and things that cry out to be exploded. Someone could easily get inspired. Someone like Oak Jeff, for instance. Most people do everything they can to avoid breaking a wine glass, but at Time Warp, we do just the opposite. Today, we're going to use a firecracker to break the wine glass. And as always, eye protection. Fire in the hole. Our cameras show that while the explosion does lift the wine glass off the stand, there's no breakage. The explosive forces are able to escape out of the top of the glass. 